Right, good morning, everyone. And uh, my name is Yulia Linares. I'm Chief of Lymphoma Services at Miami Cancer Institute Baptist, with Baptist Health South Florida. So we're going to be switching gears a bit uh, from uh, breast cancer world, which is uh, not my world anymore, and I'm kind of happy about it. Those trials are very complicated, <laughs> so and there is no crossover, <laughs> so it's allowed in our trials. So thank you for being here early this morning, and um, these are our disclosures. Um, so we'll start with uh, case number one. Sorry, it looks like it altered a little bit um, in transition. So. Uh, we have a 59-year-old male patient anesthesiologist uh, with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, and early relapse, so relapsed eight months post-CHOP. Uh, he presented in uh, January 22, no B symptoms, uh, with enlarging left cervical lymph nodes, underwent excisional uh, biopsy, uh, with a biopsy demonstrating germinal center, CD10 positive, uh, not double expressor, not double hit, um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, and uh, he had a PET scan uh, that basically demonstrated hypermetabolic uh, lymphadenopathy uh, in the cervical supraclavicular uh, lymph nodes as well as uh, in the inguinal lymph nodes. And uh, appropriately so, he was treated with RCHOP uh, for six cycles. Uh, so then, less than a year post-completion uh, of uh, initial therapy, in April, he develops increasing lymphadenopathy on physical exam, undergoes a PET scan, basically demonstrating relapse. Um, so uh, he is referred to uh, us as a cellular therapy center for a consultation. Um, so in the old times, right, we would have been thinking about chemotherapy and potential autologous stem cell transplant, but now we have other modalities available, and uh, the timeline here is very important. Um, so uh, uh, on the 15th of May, he's already having a consultation with us, and he's a busy anesthesiologist, so this was a telehealth consultation, uh, and so uh, uh, we are able to set him up uh, for the insurance approval uh, and screening for CAR T cell therapy in accordance to uh, Zuma 7 trial and transform trials uh, demonstrating improved uh, EFS uh, with CAR T cells in patients that are early relapsers. Uh, already, about two weeks later, on the 31st, he undergoes uh, lymphocyte collection, uh, and then subsequently, uh, in about a week, uh, uh, bridging therapy, because he does have a rapidly enlarging disease. The bridging therapy is r polituzumab, rituxan polituzumab, which is important to note, because this is uh, a chemotherapy-free uh, regimen. Uh, he then undergoes lymphodepleting therapy uh, and axisal infusion. Uh, on the 27th of June. So basically what we call needle-to-needle -needle time, so the time from uh, the T-cell collection to uh, the uh, CART infusion is only 27 days, uh, which is really remarkable. And uh, I actually did not see this patient in person until he came into the hospital. So we did all this via telehealth uh, to expedite his time to uh, receive CAR T cells because, uh, as you know, when the CAR T cells first came out, uh, the one of the main issues was that a lot of patients didn't make it to CAR T cell infusion just because uh, uh, they would be uh, perishing due to rapidly produ uh, progressing disease, organ compromised, uh, and um, and tumor lysis. Uh, the patient uh, was admitted uh, since this was Axisel and uh, developed a CRS, uh, cytokine release syndrome, and ICANN, so neurotoxicity, uh, which were grade one, uh, manifested as persistent fever for 24 hours that would not subside with uh, Tylenol. Um, so he received tocilizumab, which is IL-6, um, uh, in, uh, inhibiting antibody uh, times one only, and dexamethasone 10 milligrams uh, times one, uh, and uh, recovered rapidly. He was discharged home on the 5th of uh, July, day plus eight, and subsequently, can, subsequently was seen via telehealth uh, and local labs, uh, and then uh, a couple of times a week in clinic. He was on Keppra to prevent uh, seizures. Uh, his vitamin D level was optimized, and I will mention why 
later. And on the 9th of August, I had a visit with him, which was telehealth, and I was surprised to see that he was in the operating room, uh, fully <laughs> dressed in his scrubs with his wife, who's uh, his tech, I guess. And, um, and that was our visit. So he was doing great. So basically, uh, from May to August, within three months, uh, we have a patient with uh, previously a disease that could be deadly to now someone who is uh, in complete remission on the last uh, PET scan and uh, fully functional uh, and uh, received uh, only antibody-based chemotherapy bridge and then uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, CAR T cells uh, were approved uh, in the last year for uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and transformed uh, low grade lymphoma patients who are early relapsers. So, meaning in the second line for patients who uh, relapse less than 12 months post initiation of um, the initial chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, lysacaptogen meroglucil additionally uh, was approved for uh, the second line diffuse large B cell lymphoma treatment in patients who are not candidates for autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, and I'm sorry, I think this font changed on the screen, that's why it's so small. <laughs> Um, so, first we'll discuss Zuma 7 trial. So, it's a phase three trial of access cell versus standard of care in the second line treatment of uh, large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and standard of care is a chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, on this trial, most patients received either access cell or uh, salvage chemotherapy uh, with uh, significantly higher overall responses with access cell uh, and, as well as CR rates. But if you look uh, at the number of patients receiving definitive therapy, 94% of patients received access cell, which is a definitive but, uh, potentially curative therapy, and only 36% uh, of patients in the standard of care arm uh, received autologous stem cell transplant, so uh, the definitive therapy. And the crossover was al allowed. Uh, the primary endpoint was EFS, and so if we look at the curves, they separate nicely with fourfold greater median EFS with access cell and uh, two and a half fold uh, greater EFS at two years with uh, access cell. If we look at an overall survival curve, again, uh, we see that uh, uh, access cell uh, performs significantly better uh, with median overall survival not reached with access cell uh, versus 31 months with st standard of care. And again, 56% of standard of care patients actually received subsequent cellular immunotherapy of protocol. So definitely that impacted the overall survival uh, on this trial, but we cannot deny this patient's potential curative therapy, so that's why crossovers are allowed in these trials. Um, so the next trial is TRANSFORM trial, and it's a phase three study of lysacaptogen meroglucil versus standard of care in the second line treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and um, again, with the primary point being uh, event-free survival, and uh, we see that again, uh, CAR T cells perform better than standard of care uh, with um, improved median, uh, median EFS uh, and uh, with higher overall response rates, CR rates, uh, the median duration of response was not reached with lysa cell as well as median PFS and uh, OS. Uh, and again here we did have significant crossover with 80% of uh, patients in the standard of care arm eventually receiving uh, cellular therapies. So uh, if we look at toxicities, uh, they're somewhat different. Uh, with access cell, um, patients having a CRS at 6% rate uh, with median time to onset of three days and duration of seven days, uh, while with lysa cell, uh, CRS grade three uh, was only 1% with median time to onset of five days and median duration of four uh, day. So uh, as far as neurologic toxicity, uh, neurologic events of grade three or higher were recorded in 21% of patients in Zuma 7 uh, trial and in 4% of patients in transform trial. Uh, 
there was no great five CRS or uh, neurologic events uh, in Zuma 7 trial and no great four or five CRS or neurologic events uh, with uh, Lysa cell. Um, so that's why, again, traditionally we think of uh, Lysa cell as somewhat uh, less toxic uh, treatment, less toxic CAR T cell option. Uh, and uh, when we think of patients that are uh, maybe uh, have lower performance status uh, or have um, uh, some organ compromise, uh, Lysa cell may be a good option. There was also an outreach trial that demonstrated that about 25% of patients can receive Lysa cell and not be hospitalized because they do not experience uh, neurotoxicity or CRS requiring hospitalization. Um, so the other exciting study uh, was uh, demonstrating safety and efficacy of lysocaptogen merolucil as second line therapy in adults who were not candidates for standard therapy, uh, such as hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and this was an open lady, uh, label uh, phase two trial. Uh, so uh, the patients on this trial were older, 70 years old uh, or older, uh, with performance status of two, and uh, they had some uh, minor organ dysfunction. I mean, I have to say that they weren't very sick patients because we probably wouldn't choose uh, patients with significant organ compromise. Uh, for CAR T cells, uh, but uh, they were more sick enough to consider them uh, not candidates for stem cell transplantation. Uh, and in this trial, we have remarkable results with 54% of patients experiencing uh, complete response uh, and um, with overall response rate of 80% and 70% of patients alive at one year. Uh, the toxicity, uh, again, was uh, low with grade 3 CRS, only 2%, and no grade 4 or 5 cytokine release syndrome, and grade 3 neurotoxicity in 5% uh, of patients, and no grade 4 or 5 neurologic events. Uh, so in June 2022, uh, lysocaptogen merolucil was approved for patients who relapsed after first-line diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or transformed lymphoma therapy and are not uh, candidates for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation due to comorbidities or age. And then something interesting, so in addition to uh, being certified in internal medicine, uh, hematology and oncology, I'm certified in lifestyle medicine. So I always look at how do other factors, how does our nutrition, micronutrients, exercise, sleep, and so forth, how do they impact our cancer survival or cancer treatments? And this is just one slide on this because uh, frequently in practice, uh, small things that are very easy to uh, adjust and tailor are not uh, addressed and, uh, and not noticed. Uh, so vitamin D uh, is not just a, a, a regulator of, of calcium metabolism. Uh, it's very important to remember that vitamin D is crucial for the maturation of immune system cells. So maybe you remember how in the old times patients with tuberculosis went uh, into the sunny places, right, to, to the mineral springs, and they got better. And, you know, before when you're reading about it in classic literature, you think, well, how, how did that work? Well, most likely it worked because they were able to produce vitamin D that activated the immune system to fight tuberculosis, basically help them form granuloma, granulomas and wall off um, to, uh, tuberculous bacteria. Uh, so it turns out that vitamin D levels are associated with uh, outcomes in lymphoma. For example, in T-cell lymphoma, low vitamin D levels are uh, associated with uh, dismal progression-free and overall survival. Uh, there are some studies demonstrating uh, lower responses to RCHOP in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients that are low in vitamin D. Uh, and it turns out that actually vitamin D insufficiency affects uh, CAR T-cell efficacy, and patients who are vitamin D insufficient have uh, decreased overall survival with CAR T-cell treatments. 
Um, so I do recommend uh, for lymphoma physicians, and I would say probably for physicians in, in all uh, fields to measure vitamin D in their patients and uh, help them uh, reach a level that's around 50 to 70 or so, uh, not the minimal uh, uh, range of normal, uh, in order to potentially improve uh, therapeutic efficacy. And again, we don't know, no one will pay for these studies, but it is just one small thing that we can do uh, that it do not harm, and once you know and see, you just cannot unsee. So uh, the joke is my patients usually do very well. I always say it's because I replete vitamin D. Uh, but they love it. It also brings a holistic touch to a clinic, right? So because they always want something. You give them the best working chemotherapy, and they think it's, it's just fine. They take it for granted, but you fix their vitamin D, and patients get very excited because it's a little bit more, more holistic. Um, so, uh, overall, in regards to uh, utilizing CAR T cells in community, I think it's very important to remember uh, that uh, CAR Ts are an option for the second line and third line uh, relapsed refractory B cell lymphomas now. Uh, it's extremely important to refer your patients once you suspect uh, that they might be candidates, even if they're not, uh, still it's uh, good to get the ball rolling because as you know, insurance approval can be a major obstacle to delivering this therapy on time. And uh, with the patient that I just presented, I mean, we spend many, many hours uh, in discussions with insurance on how to hospitalize him or not, because there can be a lot of, uh, just a lot of barriers to prompt delivery of this therapy, and that does affect outcomes. Uh, we have to uh, work with community physicians on, uh, the, on agreeing on bridging therapy because, for example, bendamustin can affect the quality of CAR T cells uh, and their persistence for post CAR infusion and affect outcomes. Um, we also need to deliver appropriate supportive care while patients are awaiting uh, and uh, make sure that the treatment is uh, administered promptly uh, with access cell now having the best needle to needle time from 17 to 21 days like with this patient. So, and now next case, um, again, very interesting case and I would describe this case as uh, reframing the way we think about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma because we traditionally think about it almost uh, as of leukemia, so a disease that uh, needs to be put in remission and if you are not cured, then you don't, you don't do well uh, with relapses. Um, we used to use uh, chemotherapy regimen after chemotherapy regimen, but here we have a case of thinking of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma kind of as of chronic disease. Um, so we have an 86-year-old uh, female with a history of severe coronary artery disease, status post cabbage, uh, chronic kidney disease, and newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So she came in in August 2020 uh, with um, diffuse lymphadenopathy above and below diaphragm. Uh, the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was uh, CD10 negative, MAM1 positive, CIMIC positive, uh, BCL2 positive, so double expressor, high KI 67, uh, and um, it was not double hit disease, uh, so there was no MIC or BCL2 translocation. Uh, on the PET scan, there was uh, hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy above and below diaphragm, as well as splenic involvement consistent with stage three disease. Uh, and uh, if we look at her labs, so she was in spontaneous tumor lysis and her potassium was already going up. She had high uric acid, she had a touch of renal failure, uh, and her performance status was decreased uh, due to her disease. Um, so the patient was very angry. She, her husband recently died, and basically she told me she just wanted to die, and um, she didn't want any chemo or any side effects. And I said, well, do you want to die now or maybe a little bit later? And she's like, well, not now. I said, well, all right, give me a chance. So I asked her to give me a chance with her. So we started very gently with uh, rituximab, gym, uh, gymcytobin, and oxaloplatin. Uh, and um, she tolerated treatment relatively well, but had a neutropenic fever, pneumonia requiring hospitalization. 
Uh, and after that, she basically said that she didn't want any more chemo. So I said, all right, but maybe we can still do some treatment. Give me a chance yet again. And so what we did is we switched to rituximab, polituzumab, uh, which polituzumab is an antibody drug conjugate. And um, she underwent uh, two cycles with complete uh, remission on PET scan. And then she uneventfully completed six cycles of this treatment with excellent quality of life, uh, basically getting back to her baseline, uh, enjoying her family. Um, and uh, so I'm very happy that we now have uh, this regimen, polituzumab, rituximab, bendamustine. Uh, it was studied in a phase two trial of polituzumab, rituximab, bendamustine versus rituximab, bendamustine in transplant ineligible, relapsed refractory, diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients. Uh, and um, it was a small study that uh, randomized 40 patients to our benda pola and 40 patients to our benda uh, with higher CR rates at 40% uh, in the experimental arm versus standard uh, our benda mustin. There was improved PFS and overall uh, survival as well uh, with uh, experimental chemotherapy. And this regimen was approved in 2019 uh, for relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma after two or more lines of therapy. But actually in NCCN guidelines, uh, it is listed as second line therapy for non-stem cell transplant candidates uh, and as a bridge to CARS, uh, which is very important because in this patient we used it as second line because one not. So everybody thinks about about this regimen, our bendapola is a third line regimen, uh, but I say why, why give our ice, uh, which is highly toxic, requires hospitalization, if we have this our bendapola regimen, which is an outpatient regimen uh, that does not cause significant cytopenias, does not cause much nausea and preserves quality of life. And if we actually look at uh, the studies for our bendapola in the second line versus uh, third line, there were higher response rates in patients who received the regimen in the second live line at 74%. Uh, and even re uh, refractory patients had higher response rates. Uh, and um, there was improved median PFS and OS when it was delivered in the second line. Uh, we had an abstract at ASH as well uh, for the second line, uh, our Bendapola, and uh, the CR rate was 67%, which is very high. And if you remember uh, the CR rates with uh, our traditional RIs regimen, uh, they're definitely not better than this. Uh, and the other question is, do we really need Bendamustin? And I say we don't, because uh, usually we use this regimen for patients who already experience uh, chemotherapy, and actually uh, there is a signal that rituximab polituzumab can be just as effective uh, as rituximab polituzumab bendamustin, uh, just because uh, polituzumab is a very good targeted ADC, uh, and we can get high CR rates without having chemotherapy included in this regimen. So. So what happens next? Um, so this patient enjoys remission, uh, but then she relapses about a year later. Um, she still states the quality of life is most important. Um, so what we do is we start her on tafacitumab Revlimid at 10 milligrams, which is uh, subsequently decreased to five milligrams. She has excellent response on physical exam, uh, and after four cycles, she's already in complete remission. And then she continues for 13 cycles uh, of tafacitamab revlimid. So ELMINE trial looked at tafacitumab uh, linalidomide uh, in relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, demonstrating high CR rates 40% and overall response rate of 60% uh, with duration of response of 43.9 months. Uh, and again, we have to remember that this is uh, what we would call a chemotherapy-free regimen. So this is a fully outpatient regimen uh, with the patients not losing their hair, not having too many side effects, and basically being able to enjoy and live their uh, lives. Um, so this patient does well, uh, but then again, uh, she develops uh, suspicious hypermetabolism uh, in one of the lymph nodes. Uh, there's a concern for progression. She still continues with tafarevlimid, uh, but then in January she has a PET scan demonstrating unequivocal progression. Uh, and what do we do? We actually uh, 
go back to the initial regimen, rituximab, polituzumab, um, and we start a single patient IND for the novel drug epcoritimab, which is a bispecific T cell engager. Uh, and this is a non standard approach because you would think so. Why not? Why should we not treat target? Uh, why should we not use targeted therapy that worked initially that had excellent side effect profile? And so, actually, after uh, just one cycle of rituximab of pol and polituzumab, this patient goes back in complete remission, and then she gets six cycles, and she's doing great. So we celebrated her 88th birthday together in Miami. Her family invited me, and she's now 89. So now she's three years post the initial diagnosis. She has two puppies, and she's very happy. Mm -hmm. And you remember that historically, these patients would have survival of less than six months. Um, so uh, I think that this case really helps us rethink uh, the strategizing of treatments uh, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I think of them as of playing chess pretty much, right? You have to think about all your moves. You can't use treatments that are too toxic initially because you might jeopardize your later lines. And it's very important to think about the quality of life for our patients, especially older patients, because I think there is such a valuable transfer of knowledge that happens between these older patients and then in their last years and their families. And it's uh, precious. So what's next, right? Because uh, she's 89 and now she decided to not give up. Uh, so what happens if she relapses? So yet again, uh, we have more drugs approved this year. So the new kids on the block are uh, bispecific T cell engagers. So basically the antibodies that approximate uh, T cells to the tumor cells via antigen binding, enabling the T cell killing of uh, tumor cells. So the two uh, antibodies that were recently approved are glafitimab and epcoritimab. And um, everybody keeps asking which one is better. And we can't really tell uh, because they were never compared head to head and they probably will never be compared. But there are some differences I would like to highlight. So glafitimab is given for 12 cycles, so limited duration treatment versus epcoritimab is given subcutaneously until disease progression. Both have high response rates, uh, uh, approximating 60% uh, in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that's multiply relapsed refractory on the third line or later. CR rates are around 40%. Uh, and duration of response are over a year. These medications do cause CRS and neurotoxicity and necessitate premedications and inpatient monitoring uh, for earlier cycles. Uh, most importantly, in both trials, there were over 30% of patients uh, who received CAR T cells, so basically definitive therapy. And previously, we had no options for patients who received CAR T cells, no options that worked. Uh, but now, uh, the trials demonstrated that both epcaritimab and glafitimab induce uh, durable responses in patients who failed CAR T cells. Um, they're both approved now for third line and later in adults with relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma or transformed lymphoma. And epcaritimab is also approved for uh, patients with uh, large grade B cell lymphoma that is triple hit or double hit. Uh, and um, this is the graph just demonstrating that uh, in CART-exposed patients with epcaritimab, overall response rate was still high for this population, 54%, and CR rates uh, at 34%. Uh, and um, the uh, duration of response with these drugs uh, is highly dependent on uh, achieving CR with patients achieving, achieving CR, uh, having a longer duration of response. Uh, and uh, uh, very importantly, uh, in patients who receive glafitimab, as you remember, uh, uh, medication that is given for limited duration of only 12 months, actually, once you stop uh, glafitimab, there is an extended uh, complete remission with a median duration of complete response of uh, 34 months. And I think that we have our next case. All right. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to this activity. It's great to see familiar faces again.
Um, uh, Mariel Grajales, I'm one of the faculty members at the Moffitt Cancer Center in the myeloma section. And um, today we're gonna have an overview of a case um, that will take us essentially throughout the treatment um, history of a patient with newly diagnosed myeloma, then we'll talk about early relapses and late relapses as we go. So the first thing that, um, the first case, the, this case that we're gonna present is a 62-year-old African-American man, um, pretty much a standard uh, past medical history of, of any American, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and whatnot. Um, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma back in 2016, and um, I'm highlighting some of the labs uh, hemoglobin 10.8, albumin 3.6, LDH elevated at 192, IgG uh, almost 6,000, serum free kappa light chain over 1,000 at almost 1,300, uh, with a kappa light ratio uh, at 158 and an M spike of 4.7. Of note also, the uh, beta 2 microglobulin is 4.2, right? So this patient, as any patient with newly diagnosed myeloma, underwent a bone marrow biopsy that demonstrated over um, a 90% monoclonal plasma cell involvement. And the, the fish analysis did not show, um, frankly, high-risk mutations, and we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about those mutations in a minute. PET scan did show, however, um, uh, several lesions uh, that were consistent with multiple myeloma, and this patient was ultimately started on RVD based on the SWOG 777 trial, um, which nowadays we call it kind of an old trial. Uh, it compared RVD versus um, Revlimid Dex, and it was originally designed for patients that were not intended to be taken to transplantation, although uh, a really good proportion of these patients ended up having autologous stem cell transplantation as consolidation. It's interesting that this trial was started back when Velkid was given in a intravenous formulation, right? So obviously we know that the IV formulation over the sub-Q formulation has a way higher risk of peripheral neuropathy. And as a matter of fact, this trial had a very outstanding 28% treatment discontinuation rate because of that, right? So they got two, eight months of eight cycles of RVD followed by REV um, as maintenance thereafter. And this is what le this was, was what led to RVD being the standard of care for so long, right? Patient received four cycles uh, of RVD, achieved a very good partial response, which is what we aim for uh, for consolidation prior with uh, high dose melphalan and, and autologous stem cell transplantation. There is, as, as a matter of fact, just as you, just so you know, there is no difference in taking some a patient at a very very good partial response, which is decreased by more than ninety percent in the myeloma numbers, right? So, for example, if your M spike is five, less than 0.5, right? Um, there is no difference between a VGPR and a CR, but there is a difference when we take those patients at a, to transplantation at less than a, P, uh, than a very good partial response. Those patients at a PR will tend to relapse sooner, okay? So this patient ultimately was taken to autologous transplantation um, after achieving a very good partial response, and the um, day 90 restaging demonstrated a stringent complete response. Since he was not high risk, he was started on maintenance with Revlimid only 10 milligrams days one to 21, and he did great for five years while, while on this maintenance. So the first question that, we, that, that we're gonna ha try to address is, what is the staging of this guy? And that's why I wanted to highlight the numbers, right? Remember that I, we have two staging systems. Well, now we're gonna have three, but for now, it's the international staging system and the revised international staging system based on beta-2 macroglobulin and albumin. That's for the ISS. The revised ISS includes LDH and also the mutation. And this is what I was referring to earlier. In the Fisher cytogenetics, we have three bad mutations, quote unquote. Del 17 p translocation 414, and translocation 1416. Having one of those automatically puts put you at a, a revised ISS-3, okay? Nowadays, Patients with gain with amplifications or gain of 1Q are also considered um, high risk, although the revised ISS does not include that, the revised ISS-2 will, okay? Um, typically, patients with high-risk disease do benefit from, uh, from um, sorry, maintenance with a protosome inhibitor, okay? So, so those patients typically will have Velcade incorporator or Kyprolis or Nilar or whatever the case might be, okay? And this opens the door for what to do with a newly diagnosed myeloma nowadays, right? We talked about RVD based on the SWOG, but now as we 
no, um, Dara RVD is taking, is gaining more and more traction. And that's very that has a very simple reason, the Griffin study, right? We have other tr trials that have demonstrated the benefit of four drugs over three drugs, um, especially in Europe, Cassiopeia and whatnot, but they were using drugs that we don't necessarily use in the US, like thalidomide, melphalan as induction. The Griffin study compared Dara RVD versus RVD. Um, and uh, it was a phase three clinical trial that demonstrated phenomenal uh, and, um, and deep responses, okay? Patients with Dara RVD basically had a 95% um, overall response rate, which, which was impressive. But most importantly, this was very well tolerated altogether, right? Um, sure, neutropenias, uh, peripheral neuropathy still were a part of the side effect profile, but adding daratumumab did not necessarily add to that. And as you can see, the four-year progression of free survival, we're talking almost at 90%, 87%. Those are impressive numbers, especially when we take into consideration that 20 years ago, myeloma uh, was one of the most depressive, depressing diseases in, in, in malignant hematology, right, with uh, overall survival of two to three years at most. Um, but if you look at the depth of responses, right, on the bottom left, you can see that the rates of CR, VGPR, stringent CR, and MRD negativity were significantly better with the addition of this monoclonal antibody, anti-CD38. Not only that, the infectious overtime, which were the most common side effect um, seen on the study, were also getting better as time went by, right? So uh, this was, and this is now, uh, for the most part, the, the most commonly used induction regimen for these patients with newly diagnosed myeloma in the community. Is it wrong to do RVD nowadays? No, not everybody. I mean, the, the problem in myeloma is that we know that we overtreat some people, but we don't know who do we need to overtreat. Um, we don't have that um, measurement just yet. We use the high risk cytogenetics to tend to be more aggressive, quote unquote. But in reality, we know that there are patients that have really bad biology and do great for five, 10 years, right? And we have the guys that have very standard risk mutations and do horrendous in a matter of a year. So we don't r truly know. But nowadays, Dara RVD became kind of the standard of care. Now, unfortunately, this guy, after um, five years of maintenance with Revmid, um, progressed as expected, right? Um, and now the question is what to do next. Great performance status. And I wanted to point out something with these questions. So when do you treat a patient with suspected relapsed myeloma? Is it because clinical progression, like you know, new lesions on, on imaging, the M-spike changing, um, urinary M-spike changing, increase in the light chains? Well, in reality, any of those, right? It's not because your numbers look great that if you have new lesions on a pet, you have to ignore, right? You have to treat because that is progression no matter how you look at it. So. It's very important to look at the patient as a whole and to keep in mind that you have to follow up with the interval um, imaging studies that are uh, appropriate for these patients. Every patient with, with myeloma should be getting an imaging study, ideally a PET or a whole body CT scan or a whole body MRI. Skeletal surveys are not as sensitive as um, the other forms of, of imaging. So very important to keep that in mind. Bomarab biopsy only to be repeated when uh, the patient is showing sign of progression. Now, um, this is just to point out what, was, uh, what I was referring to. Um, 20 years ago, horrendous survival, but that's because you know, treatment options would fit within one hand, and actually you would have fingers left, right? Steroids, chemo, transplant, and transplant is indeed chemo, right? Because transplant does nothing for myeloma. What does the trick for myeloma is the high-dose melphalan. Um, after that, came over, right? And then we started having the protosome inhibitors, EMIDs, uh, monoclonal antibodies after 2015 with the appearance of daratumumab, et cetera. And in the past couple of years, we've, getting, we've been getting more and more traction. As a matter of fact, these slides were made last week and they're already obsolete, right? Because although I had included telquetamab on Monday, our friends from Pfizer got um, their newer uh, BCMA by specific antibody approved, uh, which is l -ranatumab. So we have a lot of action in myeloma. Um, and this is a very encouraging conversation to our, with our patients, right? Because ultimately, although we're talking about an incurable disease, there is such a thing as a functional cure. If the median age of diagnosis is 69 and the life expectancy in the US is 76, if we extend the life of a patient over, the, over the, that window and they die of something else, I did my job, I kept them alive, right? 
Um, so, and that's how we have to look at it, right? I hate that label of an incurable disease because this is more a treatable disease nowadays. So it, we have to look at it as a chronic condition more so. This is another way of looking at the arsenal that we have. And, and the white boxes are the ones that are FDA approved, although venetoclax is not FDA approved, but it's used off label uh, for patients with translocation 1114. But we have to, oh, there's a bunch of white boxes. It didn't look like that. But anyhow, uh, we have a pointer here. Uh, nope. I have no idea. Anyhow, Elranatamab is the other one that was approved, right? Um, Regeneron, AMG701, um, JCAR, uh, Felza attack, um, Mesigdomide, Abertomide, Sevastamab, they're in the pipeline. And we're looking at possible um, approvals in the upcoming years, so more and more drugs to come. And this is just an overview, right? Um, we know that, like I said, DAR RVD versus RVD for most patients uh, with newly diagnosed myeloma. Then what to do when those patients relapse? Because it's going to happen, right? Uh, statistically speaking, these patients are going to relapse. And we know that three drugs are better than two drugs for the most part. We know, we suspect that four drugs are better than three. Um, and that's the thought process that we have to keep when we talk about um, early relapse myeloma. Keep in mind that if you can give three drugs to these patients, please do so, right? And we have all these phase three clinical trials that have demonstrated that, that the addition of a third drug does make an impact in terms of progression-free survival, okay? And we're gonna briefly run through these uh, studies just to show you the curves, right? But before we do that, we have to ask ourselves, how are we gonna sequence these drugs, right? Because the first question that has to come to mind when the patient relapses is, what drug is he refractory to? And that is the most important question. If the patient is refractory to Revlimid, it's not necessarily the best idea to add a drug to Revlimid because for all purposes, you're giving um, monotherapy at that point, right? The patient already told you, no, I do not respond to Revlimid. You could recycle this drug later in the game in a different combination that you used before, but when we're talking about an early relapse, switching gears make, makes a lot of sense, right? So the first question is, Refractory to, to Revlimid, yes or no? And these are the options, right, um, if, in both scenarios. The first um, trial that we're gonna, well, I don't know what happened with the title. Um, the first trial that we're gonna show here is the Pollux trial, so DARA RVD versus um, Revlimid DEX. And you can see that there was a, over a doubling in the, in the PFS for these uh, patients to 44 months with um, a very similar toxicity profile. And the depth of responses were very much improved as well. Um, the stranger CR rate uh, essentially tripled, right? And so did the MRD negativity. And MRD negativity nowadays should be kind of what we aim for, right? Uh, MRD stands for minimal residual disease. There are different ways to do it, flow cytometry or next generation sequencing. And it will basically evaluate uh, one cell in either 100,000 or a million uh, nucleated cells, and that is the best that we can get, right? So MRD negativity is the deepest possible response that we can obtain, and um, doesn't mean that myeloma is gone, right? So for example, if the patient after transplant is MRD negative, I cannot tell them it's okay to stop maintenance, right? Because it just means that we cannot detect one cell in a, in a million, right? But what about one cell in 100 million, in a billion? We don't have that technology. So as of now, with the data that we have, MRD cannot necessarily guide us to do therapy. Um, it is, however, a surrogate marker for PFS and OS, okay? So progression-free survival and overall survival will be um, longer on those patients that have, um, that have achieved MRD negativity. Um, the other aspect of it is of it would be, what if the patient is MRD positive? Then you have an, uh, more arguments to say, to convince that patient, dude, you really need to stay on your maintenance, right? And that is kind of how you have to play that conversation. Then we have to um, bring the Castor study, which was, which compared DARA Velkidex versus Velkidex. And again, we're seeing a significant improvement in progression-free survival. Candor, which was DARA KD versus KD, did the same. We went from a progression-free survival of 15.2 to 28.6 months and with depth of responses that were better. Apollo, Dara Pomdex versus Pomdex, same scenario. We had a doubling of the progression-free survival with the addition of these drugs. And all of these additions did not contribute to more toxicity, and that's the important part. Icaria, which was isatuximab, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone versus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. Keep in mind that isatuximab is another CD38 
um, different formulation that daratumumab, this is an IV formulation, and the schedule is slightly different. Um, not this necessarily the same drug, that targets a different epitope and has a slightly different mechanism of action, so it's another option. Um, sometimes the question is how to sequence DARA and ESA. There's not a lot of data for that, okay? Just an FYI. That's a tough, another conversation for another day. Ikema, uh, compare ESA KD versus KD, and this had a phenomenal um, progression free survival advantage, right? With a PFS, median PFS of 41.7 months. So we're talking about 42 months in the uh, early relapse setting. Keep in mind that 20 years ago, this overall survival, not the PFS, overall survival was two years. So this is, this, this is just a testament of how good we've been getting at treating myeloma, right? And here also, the depth of responses were significantly better with uh, higher degrees of MRD negativity. Elopomdex and Elorefdex, they were both studied in the Eloquent 3 and Eloquent 2 uh, clinical trials. Again, we had a significant improvement in progression for survival and overall survival. Optimism, combination of POM, Velkidex versus Velkidex, once again, um, an improvement in PFS. So this gives you a, a trend, right, with the tourmaline as well. Three drugs in the early setting, it's ideal, obviously. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was Dr. Alamar, um, you have to treat the patient, right? You have to take into consideration the comorbidities. If the patient has neuropathy, avoid um, Velkid. If the patient has significant cardiac dysfunction, don't do Kyprolis. You know, those are the side effects profile that you have to be aware of. It's very important, and I tell this to all my patients, it's important to be aware of the side effects, but not afraid of them, right? Because some of them we can manage, but we have to be aware. We have to understand um, the rationale for using these drugs. So this guy, 62-year-old uh, with uh, revised ISS2, ISS2, multiple myeloma, um, got RVD followed by transplant, met ref maintenance, um, did great for uh, four years or so, and so based on this, which would be the least appealing option? Well, in reality, you could technically do most of this. The only caveat is that I would avoid a ref combination if it's, the patient is already refractory, right? So for example, DRD, eh, maybe not the hottest idea, same with Nidlaro uh, Revdex. Other options in which we switch the mechanism of action would make more sense, okay? Now, what if the patient had high risk to begin with? Would that change? Probably yes, because we would favor something that incorporates a proteasome inhibitor, KPD, DKD, SAKD, Daravelkidex, et cetera. How about if the patient had peripheral neuropathy? Revisiting Vel Velkid makes sense? Absolutely no, right? Because we cannot become worse than the disease. The disease is already doing a number on the patients. We don't need to add to it. Um, and then how to decide the second line of therapy? Well, in reality, you have to take into consideration what the patient has been exposed to, what toxicity, what type of relapse, right? Because it's not the same thing having just a biochemical relapse than just a full-blown explosive relapse with uh, lesions everywhere, extramedullary disease, et cetera, right? Um, and so the patient um, received multiple lines of therapy uh, ultimately, and he was triple class exposed, triple class refractory, and progressed after his fourth line of therapy. And this is where we get to the most exact, uh, exciting arena, right? Um, the newer form of immunotherapies. So we're talking about CAR-T and we're talking about bispecifics. And we have two CAR-T products approved for multiple myeloma, Abegma and Carvicti. The first one, um, Abegma, was uh, based on the KARMA study. Median line of therapy, six, uh, double refractory, triple refractory, and pentarefractory patients in this study. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details of how this is manufactured, um, but essentially, the overall response rate on these uh, studies, 73%, right, for the uh, KARMA study, with a you know, significant progression-free survival advantage, right? Um, the progression-free survival in this study was 8.8 .8 months, but you can see that the patients that achieved a complete response actually had a duration of response of 21 months. So we're talking about close to two years for these patients that did truly responded to, to Abegma, which is very impressive altogether in this heavily pretreated population. Again, we're talking about uh, six lines, median, um, six median lines of therapy before this, right? To put this into perspective, RVD transplant maintenance, that's one line of therapy, that's not three, okay? Um, that's a, um, a, a huge caveat that we have to take into consideration. Now, car study, very similar de trial design, um, included also patients with high-risk um, disease, um, pentarefractory, extramedullary disease, et cetera. And this patient have an overall response rate of 97.9%. Again, six median lines of therapy. 
This is insane, right? Uh, and look at the depth of responses. I mean, the strange and complete response at 82.5, right, on this clinical study. And the median PFS, um, although higher than in the um, Karma study, you can never tell a patient that one product is better than the other, right? That's not fair. It's, you know, cross trial comparison is never good practice. To me, the best um, CAR T is the first one that you can get your hands on, right? Because there is a waiting time. Um, and like, like I told you earlier, it's not because you get a BECMA that you're gonna do poorer, right? Those patients that achieve a, a, a CR get a median PFS of almost two years. So that's absolutely uh, outstanding. Now the toxicity profile, it's a little bit different to some extent. They both share the CRS uh, that Dr. Linares was uh, mentioning earlier with, with the other CAR-T products. For the most part, these CRS events were grade one, grade two. Very rarely uh, grade three. Neurotoxicity, however, was uh, a thing, um, especially on Carvicti. Um, they even um, noticed Parkinsonism uh, for some patients, okay? So that's also very important to, to take into consideration. Now, the Majestic trial for teclistamab, um, which is a bispecific antibody uh, that targets BCMA as well, uh, was recently approved uh, for the treatment of, of multiple myeloma in last year, October 25th, uh, with an overall response rate of 63% and a median PFS of 11 months. So again, we're talking a heavily pretreated population with a really good treatment option. This is, however, different to CAR-T in the sense that CAR-T, you're done, right? You do CAR-T, you respond, you wait for the disease to relapse. By specifics, you have to keep going. So that's a consideration for your patients and for uh, yourself as well, right? But clearly a phenomenal product that has to be given the first week, hospitalized, so there, there is a ramp up, days 135 or 147, um, then they're discharged and they get this teclistamab as outpatient, okay? Cytokine release syndrome was also noted here, 72%, but for the most part, grade, uh, one, grade one, grade two. Uh, some requiring tocilizumab, of course, uh, and steroids, but um, the toxicity profile was very similar to what we saw in CAR-T, uh, including infections. Infections are real with these lymphodepleting therapies, okay? So always you have to have your patient on, on anti-acyclovir uh, Valtrex for prophylaxis and uh, PJP prophylaxis as well, because their CD4 actually drops well below 200, so we're talking almost about AIDS kind of population. Monumental trial, so this is a drug that was approved um, last week um, from Janssen, is a GPRC5D, um, so different tra target that BCMA. Um, this by specific antibody also demonstrated an overall response rate of 73% with really good um, toxicity profile in terms of infection. Um, of note, dysgeusia uh, did happen in this trial. Um, hair, skin, and, and nail changes also happened, um, but infections were a little bit better. Um, this is another um, alternative for these patients with um, heavily pituitary myeloma, um, in, and in which, which has be, become kind of an underserved uh, population. As a rule of thumb, right, this bispecific uh, and CAR-T will all have CRS, neurotoxicity, cytopenias. Um, the question how to manage that, right? And like I said, um, it's important to keep the patient on prophylaxis, all right? And, that's, and, and, and consider IVIG uh, when necessary uh, for those patients that have recurrent infections and um, an IgG less than 400. Remember that if your myeloma is IgG cap, IgG lambda, you have to subtract that IgG level, the M-spike to the total IgG, right, to have the real one. Um, and this is just a summary, and in this summary, we're including the newer drug. Here's the first one, l -ranatumab. This was approved on Monday, as a matter of fact, so it's another BCMA, and that's why these slides became obsolete in, in just a week. Um, it's another BCMA um, bispecific antibody uh, for the treatment of, of late relapse uh, multiple myeloma. And very similar overall response rate, close to the 70%, very similar toxicity profile, a little bit less of CRS. Um, the infection profile was also um, consistent with what we saw with other products. Um, now the question is gonna be how to decide, right? CAR-T versus bispecifics, and they all have pros and cons. Um, we have um, three bispecifics, not two, three, and um, two CAR-Ts. Efficacy. They're very efficacious altogether. The advantage that CAR-T has over bispecifics, one and done, and those patients that 
respond to CAR-T will tell you, these are the best years of my life since my diagnosis. Those treatment-free interval are extremely important for them. Whereas by specifics, it's a weekly, every other week, some products will come out with, um, with uh, uh, every three weeks or even every four week schedule. We'll have to see what, what the final label is for those products that are on the pipeline, like uh, the 383 from AbbVie or the Regeneron. Um, CRS and neurotoxicity seen in both. Uh, both will require hospitalization as of now, right? For example, for teclistamab and CAR-T, uh, but the hospitalization is typically longer for CAR-T. Neurotoxicity, a little bit more with, um, with CAR-T, and availability. That's the big difference, because CAR-T, you cannot take somebody to CAR-T tomorrow. There is a process, right? Battle organ testing, we have to manufacture those cells, and that takes time, unfortunately. So if your patient needs treatment tomorrow, CAR-T is definitely not your answer. You should go to the by specific route, okay? Sorry, a lot of things. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one question before our break where we encourage you to exhibit, I mean, mingle with our exhibitors and pick up a raffle sheet if you haven't done so. Are there any questions? So this is a myeloma sort of question, very interesting sort of presentation. So what is the meaning of MRD for us in the world? Is it for everybody for multiple myeloma? For some patients, do you have any biomarkers which tell who MRD patient you should be treating? What is the trigger point? What does it mean after total stem cell transplantation for some of the patient who relapse into MGAS? MRD has no meaning. What does it mean? So, so let, let's start with the end. So once you have myeloma, you don't go back to MGUS or smoldering, right? There, there is a progression from MGUS to smoldering to myeloma. And as a matter of fact, these two precursor states, MGUS and smoldering, are extremely common in the U.S. We, have, we estimate that there are about 12 million people living with MGUS or smoldering, whereas there's only about 34,000 cases of uh, 34,000 new cases of myeloma per year, right? But once you get you cross the door you, of the threshold of myeloma, you're it. Now, MRD is extremely important, e, not only for us, but for the patients. Let's say that the patient is transplant ineligible, right? There used to be, um, actually, let's call the patient 72, not transplant ineligible necessarily. There used to be a cutoff in terms of age, right? Uh, for autologous stem cell transplantation, that was 70. That's not necessarily the case anymore because we have taken patients with, uh, with 75 or older. The guy, li oldest guy that I've transplanted is 78, for example, right? Very particular situation. But now with MRD, we know that we don't necessarily need to take these patients to transplantation. Anybody who's above the age of 70 and achieves MRD negativity, we tend to omit transplant at that point. So that's kind of the difference um, that MRD can lead to, right? Um, if the patient is MRD positive, we can consider it because, like I, like I said, MRD is a surrogate marker for PFS and OS. So we know that if the patient is MRD negative and he's 75, probably we can get him out of trouble with other um, forms of therapies. Now, MRD cannot necessarily dictate what to do, right? So if the patient, for example, never achieves MRD negativity, right? The patient goes to transplantation, is MRD positive. Do we really need to treat that? The answer is no. Just putting him on maintenance makes sense. Historically, the time to best responses after transplantation are not necessarily three months, right? We, we do the restaging at the day 90, but that's not necessarily the best time of response. Those, th those responses will deeper, deepen over time. So we don't need to do anything crazy if the patient remains MRD positive. Um, but if he's MRD positive, we definitely cannot pull the brakes out, right? We have to keep pushing, pushing, pushing it with, with maintenance because those little bad guys that are there are gonna lead to trouble at some point, okay? All right, thank you so much. We're gonna have our break now. Um, please head out into the exhibitor hall and we'll see you all back in here.